so one one of the things that we've got um quite consistently when we've asked for feedback from you guys is man we cover a lot of depressing bad news <laughs> and it's all terrible and horrible and the government hates everyone some more than others and it, it'd be nice to have something more positive and i came across a, a story uh this week uh that i think really fits into that build it's super interesting um and it involves someone that uh, that i actually know from a few years back was uh basically in a in, in a acquaintance circle um so it's neat to see someone doing something awesome um the story was on the hui um and it involves uh basically a, a hapu um buying back some of their land um and i thought hey i'll reach out and we'll see if we can find out more about this so on the show tonight uh i would like to welcome amber uh to speak to speak to this it seems seems really interesting and i would like you to sort of take us through where this idea came from and i guess how it started and how it's played out for you guys i think it really started with a few cousins in Fanona who sort of wanted to dream and we kind of thought well what if we could have our own whenua back and we just started dreaming and actually it sort of started as starting to look through um like real estate postings and stuff like that and looking at what land was available and if we were going to do it what we could do and um so when me and a cousin we originally went and looked at this land and it was like 100 hectares and it was just beautiful it was on top of a maunga um you could literally we had this dream of like building this glass ceiling um fuddy on it and then you could look at the stars because you could just there was no light pollution it was full of native trees and so we just i guess dared to dream which is where a lot of the the story that the hui use sort of came from and so when we started we were like we well i don't have any money at that stage i was very very poor and my other cousin is a student so he was poorer than i was and um and then my other cousin was like well i've got my own mortgage on my own funny and so we kind of <laughs> went <clears throat> what are we going to do and i remember having a chat to my cousins and one of them's quite social media savvy he's got a large following on instagram i had about five thousand to six thousand our followers on twitter at that stage that was before elon musk had bought it out and destroyed it and um yeah so i had kind of dabbled a little bit with crowdfunding and we'd managed to sort of um do a few kopapa through that managed to get a waka back purchase a waka back here and um so i suggested to the cousins why don't we just try this worst case we have zero dollars and start with the same as what we did yesterday and then best case we might get a thousand and i believe in like 48 hours we got 290 plus wow. thousand and so it was crazy because I, I remember being at a one and up in i think i was up in tauranga somewhere other than where i lived and i just i was delivering a wānana for digital and so we were teaching kaumatua there how to do digital tech and I just remember popping in between my training sessions go oh my gosh what's it at oh my gosh this is so amazing and just some of the stories that we heard um one whānau shared that it was um the tamariki's pocket money that they had core hard to mm -hmm. the cause and someone had donated like 43k just by themselves and Someone had basically said to us as well, like, look, I'm a student. I'm just going to donate you out my bus pass for the month and I'll just walk for the month. And like just stuff like that, that was really heartwarming um, mm -hmm. because we just, I guess part of it as well was just telling a good story. Like we had our tupuna who was born into this awa. He lived beside this awa. And although he may have lived in a few different other past sites, he came back and was buried at this awa and because we'd lost a lot of land the only real strip of land that we maintain is really near our urupa and floods so there was no way we were ever going to be able to build housing on it and so yeah we just i guess dared to dream and we weren't successful on that piece of land uh, we were told the highest bidder we were not the highest bidder 
and I guess the problem is is we never will be because uh, we don't have those that type of money <clears throat> and so the hui coming back and doing a bit of an interview with us was really to go um we were successful so it was about a year later mm -hmm. that we actually found another piece of land that had been on the market for a while um it needed a lot of work but the funny thing is for us we knew this was going to be an intergenerational project we might not see the fruition of everything that we want or we're dreaming of but that it would be our mokopuna to come that would be delivering some of this mahi as well this work and so we put an offer in and we actually wrote them a letter because i i remember saying to my cousin look they either want the top dollar dollar or they're going to be racist and then they won't want to talk to us anyway or they might actually listen to what we have to say and so in the end it turns out that the um the people who owned this whenua they actually put money to our give a little and then their children put money into the give a little as well and so it was their children that convinced them to go with the lower offer so that they could be part of land back and contribute to that so um oh, that's magic that was a really cool story for us to hear because we knew it was absolutely the right place for us to be. So, yeah, that's kind of what it is. And it's um, so we have 10 hectares, which the crowdfunding bought, and then my cousin bought the other half. And so mm -hmm. have a lot of pines which you want to bring down, and that's where we want to build the additional fuddy, so building out a papakainga. But most of it is actually a native bush which for us is amazing because yeah. that's the return of our rongoa, our pataka kai we're able to start growing food up there and going back to our natural ways of um of food um yeah so that's well I, I think that's the thing that that that's really grabbed me i the the images from that hui story it looks gorgeous right there yeah. in the river the native bush around phenomenal um and i i think just your plans for it, the the vision that you have for that area i mean it's a vision that's got you to where you are now and you you have a very clear vision of where you want to take it has has really grabbed me um I, I i think this is something that i would love to see other people follow do you think it's something that other other groups other communities could could emulate i think so i think it's all about the good story so as long as you can sell that you know and we were very particular because we were like if we've collected this money for land and purchasing of the land that we locked it up in a trust for a year that had very strict rules about the fact that people have core heart in this in this kaupapa and that's how we will spend that kaupapa you know that mm. money and so we had very strict rules around the trust that like the money couldn't even go to lawyers for buying the land it had to go towards the amount of the land um just to make sure we protected it in case anything happened um but you know it's it was very important for us that you know and that we go back and communicate as well to the people who have been amazing and been part of this and have helped us to get to here as well because we've built on other people as well other people's shoulders built on the shoulders of our tupuna but we've built on the shoulders of everyday new zealanders who have just given us their bus pass money and those types of things so yeah and the cool thing is having cousins and whanauna and kaumatua who just said what the heck why not let's just try it out what have we got to lose we've got no land so the best thing out of it would be that we get land and we are now we are where we are and we now have Finua. So, you know, definitely a model that I think other hapu fano, but also other communities might want to look at as well. Because mm. I, I think, I guess, if you look at how we deal with housing here in New Zealand, and it's sort of certainly something that we talk Ooh. about here a lot on the show, is yep. is the old well not even the old ways right the current ways of doing things isn't working you know we're, we're all that the whole nuclear family thing housing is, is a huge pain point for people and it isolates people from community and I, I think what you're doing is you're building or rebuilding 
uh, a community, which is just an incredibly powerful thing to me. Yeah, and I guess so that sort of is why we sort of started up to Fari Hunga Hunga as well. So it was literally one of my aunties who's actually passed away now. So it's even more special for me that we mm-hmm. continue on with this mahi. But she said to me, when we came out of lockdown, she goes, Oh, you need to fix this. You need to house our people. And I was like, What the heck, Auntie? I don't even know how to build a house. Like, she goes, I don't know, but I just know that you'll sort it out. <laughs> and um, it was one of those voluntold sessions. You know, she just wasn't taking mm-hmm. no for an answer. And so I was like, Oh, okay, Auntie, I'll have a think about it. But that's then when I kind of thought back to my IT corporate job, which is when I knew you, Chewy, and that was kind of. Mm-hmm my life at that stage and before I'd sort of rage quit and came home to the Wairarapa and went on my whakapapa journey. Um, but when we were there, people were talking about WikiHouse. And so I thought, well, everyone kept talking about how it's this innovative thing. What if it was? And part of our journey as well was actually going back and looking prior to settlers arriving to Aotearoa, how did we used to build? And actually some of those stories were pretty amazing because I don't know if you've been into Te Papa Level 4, there's the Mako Tuku Tuku Fari, Fari Puni, mm-hmm. that's up there. And it's a ropo, built out a ropo, which is, I think they call it in uh, willows, kind of willow reeds <clears throat> that grow mm-hmm. in the wetlands. So when you harvest them and you dry it, it's insulation and a noise dampener. And so even just finding that out, and my aunties and uncles were the ones who built that fari that sits at Te Papa, and it was a replica whare of the one out at Whangai Moana, I believe. And so listening to their stories, they were not allowed to use any modern tools. They had to go and re- replicate all the tools that our tupuna had made back in the day with, like, they went down south and got the special obsidian rock to be able to make the tools and stuff like that. So cool. I was very lucky to sit with a, um, one of our kaumatua who had done that project hear all the stories and I'm like our ancestors were geniuses and like the other thing as well is no one was left hungry no one was left homeless mm. in those days they would just erect a fuddy if they needed it for a kopapa and then burn it down or bring it back down to papa tuanuku if they if they didn't need it anymore and so I kind of feel that responsibility as kaitiaki on this whenua in the Wairarapa that no one should be homeless on our whenua um no one should go hungry and so First, we need to take care of ourselves and our whānau and hapu, and then through there we can empower our wider community to be able to house them and, and that type of kaupapa. So that's sort of the birthing of Te Whare Hanga Hanga and where we've sort of come mm-hmm. from, and it's been a, intertwined with sort of our land back kaupapa as well um, because we want to bring our whānau back. We need more of our whānau back home um, because the mahi, there's lots of work to do, and uh, if we bring them back, but then they have all these massive mortgages and have to catch the train into Wellington, we lose everyone because it takes mm. so much time to go into Wellington. So I need them back here doing the mahi so that I can have more coffee breaks and uh, more <laughs> chill time uh, because it's pretty stressed out being, you know, mana whenua back home. So the the Tafari Hanga Hanga, that's the um, the current pledge me that you're running at the moment, which I, I believe has, what, four or five days left to go? I think, uh, is it four days now? As of 8 p.m. tonight, about an hour ago? Yeah. So I, I had a quick scan through this, and am I right in thinking that this this is almost like prefab, it almost looks like laser-cut sustainable housing? Yeah, essentially. So what we sort of did was we, as I mentioned, we went back and researched about how we used to make fari and then we've brought that forward and then we've looked at how we build housing and what's the innovation and tech around and we've actually, um, they show it in the hui, we have a giant CNC router so we were able to crowdfund to get that. Ah, okay. And so we have these designs, we can plug a USB in and with the CNC router, it has like a drill bit. And so it will, with the computer, cut out to precision, one to two mils, the same fuddy every time. So if we get it right the first time, we know that we can go print that times 100 and it will be the same all the time. And so 
it wasn't just enough for us to build funny so the same way that we do today because that's just for us Māori at the hands of colonial tools and we and we know that the systems don't work for us and 50 percent of all landfill waste is construction and demolition waste so Wow. For us to intensify housing and to house our people, we're just going to destroy Papatuanuku while we do it. So that wasn't good enough for us. So we were kind of like, well, how do we how do we make sure that we don't destroy Papatuanuku? How do we make sure it's zero waste? How do we make sure that our, our whanau are warm and dry? How do we make sure it's, um, it's um, affordable? And so we have saved some costs. We've then put in stuff where we want to double glaze and triple glaze as a bare minimum. Like, so we've tried to um, make sure that we're more efficient in the way we build, but then pull in stuff which is warm and dry for our whānau. We're wanting to play around, yes, definitely a, a lot like Minecraft. And so <laughs> although people might call it prefab, what we call it is modular. So like the wall mm. units, you can just um, print one of them out and then put it up. And so a lot of our concept as well as around Fano agency or community agency so that our communities and our Fano can build the whare and you need a lot less skilled workers to be able to do it. So 90% of this build you should be able to do with your Fano and your community. And so we want to give a bit of a build guide with it and we'd send in a tour kind of team to support them, help get them up and running, making sure the first couple are whare, but that we're also reducing our impact. So um not only just how we build the fuddy, but also like when we flush a toilet here in the wetted upper, and I'm pretty sure it's mostly the same all around Aotearoa, that goes into our awa pretty much. So no longer can we as mana whenua flush a toilet and just be agnostic to the fact that that's actually ending up in our awa. So let's look at incinerator toilets. Let's look at composting toilets. So the whole thing is an off-grid little 30 square meter home. We're looking at um, off-gridding power at the same time. And so if we don't have to pay for power and we're looking at innovative ways to be able to finance these, so whether it's a rent to own or the iwi um, or other organizations can subsidize part of the whare, then would you still work full time or would you maybe work part time and then you're able to be kaitiaki and help protect our awa and help do other things and that's even just not just our whanau but the community at a whole because a lot of our community and society runs on you know volunteer time and being able to do these cool projects and stuff like that so we've tried oh, to jam a lot can I, ask a, can, I ask a, can I ask a question about the um about the actual logistics of this what we're looking yep. at right now is this just slip and clip 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 together or does it still use nails and screws and stuff to hold it together it's a mullet so this one isn't actually screwed but we used a mullet to put all of that together so essentially when you put the fuddy together you might use screws and the reason why we want to use screws rather than nails is because you can actually pull this back down and reuse it right. again so it's recycling if you want to minimize so you might go from 30 square meter to 20 square meter you could take that square me 10 square meter wall and then repurpose that for another fuddy somewhere else so utilizing screws means that we can easily pull stuff out yeah cool. so um we've got a, it's beautiful just a just a couple of questions here before we let you go because you've been very very generous with your time and i thank you for coming on um Kiwi Boob here in the chat says, Amber, how do people sign up to volunteer on this project? Oh, so we've got um, to farihangahanga.nz. There'll be a contact form if you want to sign up to volunteer. Um, just fire away. It'll come through to myself, and then we can have a conversation or a chat about what what your skill set is, what we can do, where you're based, all those types of things. Cool. And oh, if um, people are interested in um, helping out with the the pledge me, I think um, Pat has it right there. Yep. Um, so that's on on pledge me at the moment. Uh, four days left. Um, so if people do think this is a great idea, which I think you should, I think like it's the vision that you have that that gravitated me towards the story. It, it's something that I think is quite special. So. Uh, if people want to get involved, that's how you do it. Um, I I hope that we revisit the story again in the future. 
And it's an investment, so rather than just a koha like the other stuff, you actually get shares within Te Whare Hunga Hunga. And we've tried, we've purposely made it a low investment, so only from $100, um, because we wanted the people, everyday New Zealanders, to be part of this, uh, rather than the people who can afford it at large sums, getting the benefits of what what we're producing here. When you say it's a it's an investment, I mean some people would hear that and they'd think return. You know, you invest in something, you get a financial return. How are you using the word investment when you say people can invest a hundred dollars? And what does it? How does that look for them? There's a there's a really good question. So we've got a um, on pledge me an investment memorandum, and I remember having these kind of types of conversations. And so what we've tried to use is rather than revenue and stuff like this, we've talked about cost recovery, and then also looking at the fact that it's about we're a social enterprise and it's about how many people we're housing per se. Um, and if if we get to the point where we're able to subsidise enough and make enough money um, without hindering our kaupapa and what we're doing, then hoi no, we're happy to um, discuss. And we're really communicative with our shareholders as well and the people going forward. So we want to make sure that there's a little bit of feedback about what shareholders are expecting um, and then, but also like, how do we make sure that we're not hindering the cope up and what we're trying to do, which is to house everyone to human rights. So, um, there's one chat there that I particularly want to throw out there from Deborah. Deborah says, we're so lucky to have you Amber Craig forever grateful oh. that you came home. That sounds like a oh. personal one for you. So we better put it out there. And Deborah Davidson. That's my Fenona. <laughs> They're watching. Hi. Yeah, but but the chat is just completely positive, 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 loving this, loving this. So it's interested as to, like I'm interested in the, the system you're using, the CNC uh, milling system. Like once you've got that, you know, uh, sort of down and you, and everything's working and everyone knows how it works, how that then can be put out into other communities and, you know, and, and mimicked and photocopied into other areas and other people pick up with what you're doing. There seems to be a formula that would be, uh, that would work in many other areas, many other regions for people to give it a crack. So that's exactly what we've got. So it's not just yeah. an, a whole thing about Te Whare Hunga Hunga, not just an innovative building way, um, but the other part of it as well is it's a distribution model as well. So we don't want to go into the Waikato and, and tell them how to build whare on their whenua. Uh, what we want to do is give them the CNC router so that they can have that capability and then we yeah. can share templates around Aotearoa, if not, indigenous whanau around the world as well so yeah um it, it's pretty exciting and we're already working with the university of canterbury to talk about actually 3d printing mud brick homes um because we want to mm. keep looking at what's the other new thing that we should be thinking about and how far ahead can we get and if we're not in there now then that's that's a pretty dope service i've i've watched several videos on that overseas and literally a, it's a big printer with a nozzle about this big and it goes along making making the house walls and stuff it's pretty amazing so yeah that seems like a natural progression doesn't it and then you can be the the source for other people to come to and figure out how to do it themselves you do the hard work yep. so others can learn from you essentially yep and the cool thing is you know when auntie Teresa first said to me you need to work this out i said well what what would you think auntie and she goes we need to 3d print mud brick homes and i was like well maybe let's <laughs> do something that's a little bit easier than this challenge all the systems at once um, but it's kind of cool that we've had the opportunity to work with um, some universities because that was her, always her dream. So, Cool, man. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I, think, um, I think the vision that you have, um, I think the scale and the forethought in it is, is, is something really special. So um, thanks so much for sharing it with us tonight. All right. Thanks, Kaki te. Cheers. Hey, um, just for people to know, Chewy, if they haven't heard of that before, let me show, because I've, I've done a lot of research on this. This is a concrete 3D printer printing a home. It's pretty dope. Hmm. It goes around and it does, so, does what it needs to do, makes the makes the house. There you go. That's doing over a window or an entranceway. They put some down and then they, they, they do them double-sided with a gap in the middle and then all the wiring and stuff can go, there you go. There's a 3D printed house. See, I, I love stuff like this, like but both like what Amber's doing, right? Uh, of you know, uh, we use the words prefab and, and that has loaded connotations and that sort of thing, kit set, all of that sort of thing. But just rethinking the way that we build houses, 
yeah. and it can be something like this that is absolutely using uh, quite a new piece of technology and that sort of thing and it can be like what Amber's doing with the CNC machine but the idea is the same how do we make building better houses cheaper yeah it doesn't 100%. have to be the way that we've been building houses for 100 years or more um, yeah. there's someone that I know down here in Otago who I think 20, 30 years ago um, went very old school and built himself a rammed earth oh, home. Real. Um, and he raves about it. It stays the same temperature all year round. It's moisture resistant. It's fire resistant. All of these things. And I think there's, there's, it's so often we throw out the good ideas of the past when we have yeah. a good idea and like a new idea rather than going, well, how did these two things work together? Yeah. So let me, let me uh, share a little bit of my, the background that not, it's not my background, but um, I came across, I've, I've studied quite a lot of this stuff. Here's a recommendation for anyone. Amber, here's a recommendation for you as well. If you haven't seen it, uh, there's a DVD called garbage warrior. Um, he's this crazy guy and he's living in, I think it's New Mexico and he's doing exactly what you're saying, Chewie. They build ram, ram earth houses and they use, uh, you know, bottles. Um, no, the gallery's not very good there, is it? I'll just put the trailer on. They put, uh, they, they use um, glass bottles to make all the walls and they, and the thing is he's someone who basically kept getting shut down by, um, by the local city say he wasn't allowed to do it and he was breaking all the codes and stuff and he's gone from breaking all the codes to being like building codes to being someone who they've given carte blanche there you go there's a rammed earth wall there with tires um to to actually giving being given and being given permission to test and research these theories again so this area of this is land i now have all this um they've been given permission to experiment Mind you, this is probably 20 years old, so who knows what it is now. And these houses are so amazing. And it's like you're saying, see, they're dotted all over us. People come along and they build the other person's house and they build their own house and they build the next person's house. And they tested with where the sun was and stuff. And some of the houses got so hot that they melted plastic. So they realized we needed to face it a bit more that way. But they're just, it's just a really, 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 really interesting conversation, uh, interesting documentary. Garbage Warrior is what it's called. And when you get it on DVD, it typically comes in a, um, if you buy it, a cardboard sleeve because of course it does Chewy. do you think they'd use plastic for the garbage warrior dvd